Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. Now is the winter of my discontent made glorious summer by the return of baseball. Opening day here, tomorrow. Baseball bursting with money, but aside from a few zillion dollar contracts, many players feel they're getting shafted. Our profound panel has inspired insights into that, scouting reports on the Mets and Yankees, and a look at big changes MLB is planning on the diamond. Next. Welcome to Baseball 2019 with the panel. On the left is the uh, irrepressible Marty Appel, and on the right, Anthony McCarron, both veterans of the baseball scene. And I guess we ought to start with the latest news, which is the Mets finally did something right. <laughs> Anthony, <laughs> tell us what they did. Well, they signed Jacob deGrom to a overdue, in my mind, uh, extension contract extension, which is great news because this guy was at the top of his game in 2018, obviously an historic year. And I think this sends a message to the Mets, the players and the clubhouse, certainly, and their fans about the new Brody Van Wagenen era. You know, he came in talking big and bold about how this, these were the come get us Mets. And he was DeGrom's agent before he got this new gig. And, you know, there seemed to be a slowdown in the idea of whether he was going to get a contract extension done with Jacob deGrom, maybe the best pitcher on the planet. And, you know, I think his credibility as a player's GM would have taken a real hit there. So I think Brody's a winner here. Jacob, obviously, is a much richer guy now. So he's a winner. And the Mets as a whole now have an ace to build their staff around for, for years to come. It's, um, it's a good point. Pitching, of course, you never know from year to year to year how strong the pitcher's going to be. It's not often a Tom Seaver comes along where you know every year he's going to win 20 games and he's just going to be the standout guy on the staff. And with DeGrom, it still needs to be proven over a series of years. Just like with the Yankees, Severino's certainly not an automatic. When Severino had 14 wins last year at the All-Star break, I said to myself, He's not going to win 28. <laughs> We're in for a rocky second <laughs> well, you half. Ma you mentioned Seaver, Marty, and, and my thoughts uh, about this recall him because it seemed to me the Mets were on the verge of making another huge mistake. It, this deal took so long and the, 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 uh, that they weren't going to get it done. And it, had they not, to me it would have been another another. Uh, failure like with Seaver so many years ago where they they let him go because of money dispute and the face of the franchise they wouldn't honor him and here they might it looked like it was going that way and it and uh, fortunately it hasn't but as we mentioned Tom we ought to at least um, refer to the, the very sad news about him uh, Marty I know you did two books with Tom uh, and of course, he has uh, withdrawn from public life and has been diagnosed, or, or you know, he has dementia. It's it's sad. It's such a sad story. And you know, one thing we can say about Tom Seaver is we appreciated him in his time. It didn't take like rev a revisionist look at his career. We knew he had something special there. And every time he pitched, it was must see baseball. Uh, it was like having Christy Mathewson and Walter Johnson in our time. Well, he was the guy that, you know, he led that team to that miraculous 69 uh, World Series, among other things. But he was he was so young then, but he was clearly the man, the leader. All the other players, they didn't really have any superstars on that team. No. And they all looked to him as the guy, and he fulfilled that uh, that role and... For his whole career, really, he was Hall of Fame bound and just such a standout artist at his craft. Marty, that's an interesting point about you don't have to go back. I mean, we've, the numbers revolution has changed the way we view players historically. Didn't change the way we viewed Tom Seaver. You know, right. I mean, we've taken another look at guys like Burt Blylevin, and he's made the Hall of Fame as a result of the numbers revolution and analytics becoming such a big deal. We knew Tom Seaver was great way back when, and that was never going to go away. And there, I don't think anybody could invent the statistic that wouldn't tell us how great Tom Seaver 
was as a pitcher. And uh, you, you're right, it really hits home this year, too, with the anniversary of the 69 team happening. He, he's yeah. not going to be at the celebration, which is, which is too bad. And, and uh, you know, I, I know Met fans really feel that deeply because he won't be there because he was such a focal point of that team, as you said. I was lucky enough to visit him three or four times out in Napa at, at the hillside <laughs> mansion. Um, he wouldn't like that word, but a beautiful home way up on a hill called Diamond Mountain, by the way, where he had his Cabernet grapes. And to walk with him through those vineyards and listen to him talk about his passion for wine, which I imagine was similar to his passion for being, he was a perfectionist at baseball and he was a perfectionist at at growing grapes and it's pretty good stuff by the way <laughs> he, was a, he was a rare guy in our time in our lifetime and as you mentioned i had the pleasure of doing two books with him it was when he was living in greenwich and we did the books on a beautiful sunny spring day in his backyard talking baseball for four or five hours while nancy refilled our lemonade all afternoon if there's the best day in your life, that, that kind of hits the list. <laughs> it, it, I, I, I know what that day is like because I had some afternoons like that up on Diamond Mountain with Tom and Nancy. Um, at least the Mets are finally getting around to honoring him. Um, they've had this big, you know, uh, rotunda that honors Jackie Robinson. There's nothing wrong with that. Terrific. But it's time, and, and, and they've change the address of uh, City Field to re reflect his number. And a statue is coming next year. Uh, All overdue, by the way, Tom. Yeah, like, way they, over. Yeah, I mean, they really should have done something sooner about Seaver because, I, I mean, imagine what a player would have to do and, and would have to be to replace Tom at the top of the Mets depth chart in terms of all-timers. Well, he was the franchise. And, and if there's a man who ought to burn in hell um, forever, <laughs> it's M. Donald Grant for trading him away for a bag of balls in 1977. What, what nonsense. And it was over, you know, some pennies or something. Um, I guess, and I don't want to make this show into a, into a memory lane, but we should also refer to the passing of a great baseball writer, Marty Noble, just the other day. Uh, what a joy it would be was to sit next to Marty in the press box and listen to his stories. He had a, I guess I can say, bull detector that was, that was nuclear. <laughs> I mean, the Mets PR department never, never, uh, never won over Marty Noble. What, what do you guys remember about Marty? Well, my, my one Marty story is the day he broke a huge story at a Subway series in 99, I believe it was, when they, the Mets fired several of Bobby Valentine's coaches, and Marty had the story the day before anybody else did. And I remember that it was like a thunderclap hit the ballpark that when the story was out and everybody got there to, to go to work and before the next game, Subway series, Mets, Yankees, you know, the Mets have just fired all these coaches, and, and I, I just remember the feeling in there. And that was the kind of impact a writer like Marty could have on an entire city of baseball because, you know, here the, here the, set, the stage was set with these two teams. You know, they were both obviously very good uh, in that season, and he broke a, you know, it was one of the big stories of the year on the Met beat, and, uh, you know, the Mets went pretty far that year, and, yeah. and that well, resonated. I should, I should remind me uh, or tell the audience that Marty covered the Mets for Newsday forever, and... Um, Right, and he broke in with some small New Jersey newspapers, and then he went to the Bergen Record, and then he went to Newsday. He never wrote for one of the New York City dailies. Right. So there may be some people unfamiliar with him, but all of those in the baseball community just had the world of respect for him. He had a way of observing things in layers that many of us never went. Yeah. Um, so. When he wrote, say, Rusty Staub's obituary a year ago for MLB.com, it was a brilliant piece of journalism. And then just last week on MurrayChast.com, he was a guest columnist writing about Tom Seaver. That may have been his last piece, and it was mm. a beautiful piece of work. Well, folks should look for those. MurrayChast.com and MLB.com. MLB.com with the... Uh, Marty Noble's byline. Actually, it may have been on Mets.com. 
uh, which got carried uh, by MLB. Well, if you Google yep. Marty Noble, you'll find it. All right, let's talk about this mm. season. And uh, let's start with, we were talking about players and former players. It seems mm. like the relationship between the players and the owners is getting rocky. And um, despite those huge contracts we've heard about, and now DeGrom, uh, the AP reports that this will be the second year that the average salary in, in baseball goes down. And uh, they're not happy, the players. They're, I mean, you know, they want to see these kinds of big contracts, obviously. But they think that, um, among other things, it takes too long to get to the, to the pot of gold, the six years control that the owners have. What, what do you make of how the, the nature of the relationship between owners and players right now? Well, I mean, it's fascinating, and the, the, the next labor discussions are going to be something to watch because there is some rancor between the sides over this. I mean, it took the, it took the teams and the GMs and the owners a long time to figure out that they, on the free agent market, in many cases, they paid players for what they had done already in their careers, and they were not going to get the return on investment on these enormous contracts that yeah, they were, yeah. you know, like the, when the guy was 25 years old. So then they were like, well, wait a minute, young players are more valuable to us than ever before. So that's when we, they start, you started seeing teams trading away veterans to get younger, not signing uh, older free agents to bigger contracts, and the players were used to the sort of ascension of their career, you know, you, you serve your time and you get to free agency and boom, there's the jackpot. And now the model has been tilted on its head. Yeah, and so now there's a, lot of, there's a lot of negotiation. So you get Adam Jones signing for $3 million. Yeah, or you get and Dallas Keuchel still out on the free agent market. I was just about to mention Dallas Keuchel, great left-handed pitcher, but his, his uh, problem is he's, what, 31? I right. mean, on, in the new metrics, his problem, and what, Craig Kimball not signed either, right? Or right. has yeah. he been? Right. He has not been signed. A great uh, closer, and he's 30 or 31. So, yeah, what you said. And, you know, there are, there are people who say the, the players brought it to a certain extent, brought this on themselves. The, 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 um, uh, uh, they say it for this reason. Uh, Marvin Miller gave them free agency. But his, his mantra, his, his first commandment was never do anything to undermine free agency. And yet in the last contract agreement, the players with, with their eyes on quality of life issues, uh, like you know the schedule and day games after night games and that kind of thing, travel, they agreed to this very stiff luxury tax. And you could argue that the very stiff luxury tax is a soft salary cap and they didn't see it. There was, um, you know, there was something Marvin Miller did that he doesn't get enough credit for, and it's really improved the quality of the game without us thinking about it much. But one of the many small uh, requirements that he built into a basic agreement was that the outfield walls had to be padded. Hmm. And that has led to us seeing these spectacular catches over and over again because the players don't fear running into the wall anymore as when we were all right, growing sure. up. Pete Reeser for some viewers who can go right. way back. <laughs> so uh, that was a small working conditions thing that yeah. Marvin Miller brought to the game, which is uncredited as a rule. Do we think, do you, what do you think about the idea that the next, that the biggest lift for the players, the heaviest lift is gonna be to get some collapsing shortening of the six year a uh, uh, road to free aid. Right now, owners have control for six years before a player uh, can be a free agent. It, it, it seems to me that's going to be like number one on the list. Yeah, and nobody knows what's going to happen with that either. So it sort of makes you think about guys who are, there's going to be a lot of talk about Pete Alonzo, you know, making or not making the Mets opening day roster so they can maybe hold on to one First extra year of control yeah. uh, by keeping him in the minors for a certain amount of time. Well, maybe that all that stuff is going to look different in the next collective bargaining agreement. So how does that all play into it? And uh, obviously the players union wants to get to free agency quicker and to get it back to the yeah. days yeah. of big contracts. But the only way you get a big contract now, it seems like, or some players think, is if you sign an extension with your team. It's another thing about the original Miller agreement in those early years. When Peter Seitz, the arbitrator, said free agency wins, 
by his edict, everybody would have been a free agent every year. And Miller knew that was no good. That would be everybody, you know, the, the pool would be too large. The right. salaries wouldn't really rise. So he negotiated the six years. It was kind of a give and take. Well, five years, well, seven years, and they came up with the yeah. six. So it seems like a negotiable point that could someday be altered. All right, let's talk about the Mets and Yankees. Yankees open at home tomorrow against the woeful Orioles. <laughs> uh, Yankees have a whole bunch of uh, injuries to worry about. But I liked, Marty, what one wag said, because they're opening at home, that they should invite James Dolan to throw out the first fan. <laughs> that would be a That's good ceremonial good. <laughs> touch. Uh, how, much, how concerned? What do you got? Let's see. You've got Severino, uh, Batances, uh, Gregorius, Hicks, Sabathia, all down at the moment. Yeah, well, guys go down during the course of the season anyway. Maybe yeah. it all happened in the beginning for the Yankees, and they have kind of a soft schedule in April. Their bigger problem is just that the Red Sox, on paper and off last season, are a better team. So they've got to find a way to cut into that eight-game differential from last year. And to me, that begins with Gary Sanchez returning to where we saw him a couple of years ago. How they won 100 games last year with the catcher hitting under 200 was amazing to me. Uh, but that can't go on forever. Well, you've got, a, you've got a, uh, an amazing bullpen. Um, a lockdown kind of bullpen. The pitching is um, a question mark, and especially with, with uh, Severino, who many people think is the ace of that staff, and he, the, it's the shoulder. That's, that would worry me a lot. Yeah, they definitely have some worries there. Uh, what they also hopefully will have this year is a full season of Aaron Judge, who missed almost two months last year. When we did this preview program a year ago. I was like, well, they're going to get 100 home runs out of Stanton and Judge. And they didn't. And they still set a record for home runs by a team in one season. But they really need, if they're going to win it all, they need Judge and Stanton to really come forward and carry the team on their back. And as I said, Sanchez to return to form. Anthony, you think uh, Marty's right? The Red Sox are a better team? I like the Yankees better, but then again, I liked them last year, and I was eight games in the wrong. Mm. So uh, take that uh, with a grain of salt. Um, but I, I do think the Yankees will win the division this year because really? I think they're better. Um, the one area that, to me, that is, is why the why would they be able to overtake Boston? Uh, because I think the Red Sox are going to come back to the pack a little bit, and I think the Yankees are going to win 100 games again. I, I love the bullpen. I love the power. I mean, you know, Marty's right. They they set a major league record for home runs last year, and Giancarlo Stanton led the team with 38 home runs, and he was the only guy who hit 30. So if you get a full season of Aaron Judge, I'm going to go conservative and say there's 50 right there. And then Stanton, I think, is, is a, a year more comfortable in the Bronx, and he can really sort of let it all hang out and be a better player this year. So I think you may get your 100 home runs from those two guys this year, Marty. Uh, so that power bullpen plus the power in the lineup, I love Glaber Torres. I love Miguel Andujar. I think they made some solid ads in uh, DJ LeMahieu. Uh, and, and Troy Tulowitzki, at least in spring, looked like sort of his old self. We'll see if he can handle the accumulation of games and at-bats and road trips and that sort of stuff at his age with his injury history. But I, I love the Yankees. I think they're super solid. I think there's a lot there, and I think they're going to go far. So you've got them winning the division, and you've got them, eh, you know. I still see Boston as formidable, and they've got to make up that eight-game gap. But if they're healthy, and if the pitching staff uh, pitches to form and expectations, they're right in it. You know, an eight-game differential means four more for you and four less for them. Yeah. It's yeah. not insurmountable. No, it's like when you and I play right. golf, and I yeah. beat you by eight <laughs> strokes. <laughs> do you call what we actually what we do playing golf? Um, let's talk about the National League East. And I have to throw this question out before we talk about the Mets, which is, did anybody in baseball have a better winter than the Phillies? And I'm not talking about Bryce Harper. I'm talking about the catcher they got, Real Muto, they stole from the Marlins, who's maybe the best catcher in the game. Yeah. And the kid they got for shortstop from where? The Mariner, Gene Segura. Oh, Segura, yeah. Those two moves to me were, were brilliant. Then throwing Harper on top is, <laughs> you know. Um, so the Mets, 
have a formidable opponent, at least one that we know of. Oh, but my man. goodness. That, that division, I think, is, is really tough this year. Yeah. The Mets have their work cut out for them, not just this season, but going forward as well. You know, I mean, Bryce Harper is going to be in Philly for 13 years, uh, so that makes it tough to me. I love Harper. I love him in that ballpark, too. I think he's kind of a big moment kind of guy, and I think if he's healthy, I think he's going to hit a lot of home runs there, and I think he's going to seize the idea of being the big free agent acquisition on this team that suddenly has all these expectations, and I think he's going to have a big year. And, and you know, Atlanta, you meanwhile... You've got them winning the, the, the division? I do have Phillies. them winning the division. What, what about you, Barney? Um, I want to get back to Harper for just a second, because yeah. I think most Yankee fans were kind of like okay with not signing Machado, yeah, not so. signing Harper. Yeah. I would have preferred Harper because I wanted that left-hand bat in the lineup, which is so heavy right-handed right now. So um, I think we may take a look back at that and say, oh, we, we might have blown that one. <laughs> yeah. What about the – before we rank teams in the NL East, what about the Mets? It, I mean, they have this fabulous pitching staff that is now anchored uh, solidly by Mr. DeGrom with his new contract. But the lineup – Still a lot of holes in, in the bats. You know? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, it's funny, though. I, I spoke to a scout who had been trailing them for a few weeks, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he said, I think they're going to score more than a lot of people think. I, you know, I think they've got some guys who can actually put the ball in play. Cano is going to hit at second base, I think. He's the kind of guy, no matter what age, no matter what's going on, he's going to get his. And Jeff McNeil, I mean, we don't know for sure what Jeff McNeil is, and we don't know for sure how they're going to deploy him, but I, I'm eager to see what he can do offensively. Michael Conforto, I think, is the guy. I think he's going to have a big year. Well, I think he's the guy we saw in the second half last year and not the guy who was coming out of a shoulder injury in the first half and was kind of a disappointment. So they've got some lineup anchors there that could really do some damage, I think. Uh, you know, we'll see if it com comes to fruition. Rosario, the shortstop, I like him. I think he's improving. I think everybody's got to learn how to stop swinging it. Well, that's the thing. He gets dirt. himself he gets his, he gets himself out a lot, and I think a lot of fans grew frustrated with him because last year because he was billed as this incredible prospect, one of the top guys in the game in terms of young players, and then instead of going all Ronald Acuña and just going crazy, he was kind of like, why is he why is he out again? You know, why is yeah. he making this mistake? Why is he doing that? Why aren't they playing him tonight? And I think he's. Development is in a straight line for everyone. So I think he may be advancing, even though it's taken a little bit of a different Marty, path. I want to put in a Yankee no. uh, fan's note on Cano. <laughs> um, I'm one who still regrets. Oh, absolutely. Seattle. Absolutely. And like Seaver, we knew what we had when we had him. We appreciated him and what a great ball player this was. Now, as the long history of the Yankees and all those great players... During his era, with A-Rod at third and Jeter at short and Cano at second, we were treated to watching probably the best at each of the positions mm. in the whole history of the Yankees. Uh, what a thing to appreciate yeah. while you had it. So I still regret Cano, but he's still going to be a really good ball player. Quick uh, uh, projection. Mets are what in the NLEs? Third? Third. Third, third 85 and 77. And you? Oh, he knew the win totally. Yeah. Wow. And what do you think? Are they weaker, stronger than the? Um, for the Yankees? No, no the Mets. Oh, the Mets? No, that, uh, that would be about right. It's a tough division. Very yeah, that's the problem. So you've got Washington second. Yeah. yeah, the Nationals are really, really good. They have so much pitching. They did lose Harper, obviously, but they have one of the best players mm. in baseball, yeah. Anthony Rendon. We've got about two and a half minutes, and I want to see if we can cover quickly a couple of other big things. A lot of major changes that MLB is, is, is trying or uh, trying out in, the, uh, in an independent league. Can we just tick them off quickly? Well, the big one in the Atlantic League is they're moving the mound back. I, I, yeah. I predict that does not happen. That's like changing everything that we know about baseball. Yeah. What else are they trying to do? Um, Relievers facing three batters minimum. Oh, but yeah. that's going to be this year in the major leagues, isn't no, it? No, I don't think so. Oh, it's next year? I don't year? think that's going to be agreed. To, I'm, I, I don't think that's going to fly eventually oh. either. Uh, what else are they doing? They're, uh, the trading deadline changes. Trading, trading deadline. Well, anyway, if you watch the Long Island Ducks, uh, you'll see what Major League Baseball is attempting to do. Now we have to talk about something that's never been in baseball before, at least legally, Gambling. 
and uh, and and MLB's in in bed with what is it MGM Resorts? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, on betting, and this used to be the cardinal rule. You cannot bet, you will not bet on baseball, and Pete Rose is still paying the price for that. We remember the ballparks had this huge signage, no betting permitted. It was like, you know. How, so how is gambling going to affect this game? If, uh, and one effect we've already seen is the, 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 lead, the team's going to have to submit their lineups 15 minutes ahead of the game so that, what, the gamblers know? I can tell you the players don't like this because the players don't want the added pressure of people thinking they ground it out instead of hitting it out of the ballpark because of a point spread or something like that. Right. They don't want that added pressure. They're, all, they're already hearing about, it, about people's fantasy teams, I'm sure. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, we've heard that th when a close play isn't made, when a miraculous play is made, how many people are going to say, well, it was the betting line? Well, here's the thing on this, though. There's apparently so much money uh, available out there to sports leagues to get in bed with the, the yeah, idea of fair, sports fair. gambling that it overcomes all the, scru that, the kind of scrutiny of that, like there may be annoyances with the scrutiny and that sort of thing but apparently MLB is willing to go through with it yeah. to yep, know, get it, their piece of the of the gambling yeah, MLB is taking pod. a big bite of the apple and here we go we'll see what happens but I've, we've got to leave it there Anthony McCarron great to see you Marty Appel great to see you and let's go Mets let's go Yankees